everybody and welcome back to day two of the 2022 Virtual Island Summit. Thanks so much for joining this session today. My name is Simon Turkus and I'm the content manager here at Island Innovation. Island Innovation is a global network and creative agency helping advance innovation and drive sustainable change across island communities worldwide. Please visit islandinnovation.co to learn more about our network and services. I'm very happy to be presenting this session entitled Radical Regeneration, A New Look at Sustainable Tourism. This session will also include live interpretation, which you can select by clicking the globe island icon on the menu at the bottom and selecting between English or Spanish. Before we begin, I invite you to use the chat function to introduce yourself and where you're joining from and make any comments during the session. A poll will appear now on your screen so you can let us know where you're connecting from and the sector and industry you belong to. Please make sure that you also use the um, Q&A function for your questions, and we'll do our best to make sure that we can address, address as many as possible. So we've got about, um, we've got 30% of people joining from Europe. We've got 11% from North America, 32% from Caribbean and a mix of other places, people from other places as well. And um, we've got 18% from academia, 23% of you are joining from, N who work for an NGO, 13% 13, 13 from the government, 39% private and 7% other. So it's great to see a mix of people from different sectors and different places around the world joining the session today. I would like to introduce you to our moderator today, who is Bonnie Lutus, the founder of Turtle Co, an advisor to EU Interreg Islands of Innovation project. So I invite you to please turn on your camera now and join me on the screen, Bonnie. Thanks again for being part of this year's Virtual Island Summit, and I'll now hand you over to our moderator, Bonnie Lutus. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. I'm really excited to be here today for a uh, topic that's very close to my heart as I've been working in the field of sustainable tourism on islands uh, for the past 10 years. Um, so I'm really excited about this excellent panel today and uh, it's a pleasure to be your moderator. So before we get started, uh, on many islands, tourism is the primary economic pillar. A mismanaged tourism industry can have detrimental impacts on the local environment and society. But it doesn't have to be like that. With a bit of creativity, tourism can also be a tool to regenerate the environment and help islands thrive. Today, we have excellent speakers working on inspiring regenerative tourism initiatives from islands around the world. I'm proud to introduce our panelists today, who include Rosanna Murillo, who's the General Director of Tourism of the Balearic Islands, Diana Kerner, sustainable tourism consultant and co-founder of the Seychelles Sustainable Tourism Foundation, as well as Carl Hunter, who's the property manager of St. Lucia's Anne's Chastanet and Jade Mountains Resorts. And uh, we have Stavros Kapitanaskis, CEO of Tala Ses, Ta, sorry, <laughs> Tala Ses, Crete Holiday Home and Domicy Development from the Greek islands. And last but not least, Nico Muro, founder of Visit Procida. So with uh, that, those exciting speakers lining up, I would like to uh, introduce our first guest, Rosanna Murillo, again, General Director of Tourism of the Balearic Islands. Welcome, Rosanna. Um, Bonnie, uh... Sorry, hello, good afternoon, everybody. I am having problems with the video because I'm trying to initiate it, but it says that the, the host uh, 
that's an allow me. So if you could uh, just check and allow me to turn on the video. Okay, that's perfect. Now I get it. Okay. Here I am. Hello, everybody. Hello, Bonnie. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm really happy to be with all of you today here. Happy Tourism Day. I think it's a perfect day to, to have this event and to chat with all of you. And um, first of all, let me tell you a little bit about the Balearic Islands so that uh, I can put you in, in, um, in, in, in the right mindset to understand the issues that we are having with, uh, with tourism. In 2019, we had 16.5 million visitors, 16.5 million visitors, with a population of 1.2 million inhabitants. So you can see the great numbers of tourism that we have in the islands. And in the islands, we have around 450,000 beds available in our hotels and holiday homes. So very small population, very small territory, but uh, almost 17 million visitors during 2019. Um, how can we translate all of this in the pressure and the impact in the territory? First of all, the islands are small territories. Uh, you all know that we have some limitations in the different uh, industries or economies that we can develop or we can have. Uh, we don't have economy of scale because of volume. We cannot have production industry. We cannot uh, develop very much our primary sector because of the resource consumption. We don't have enough territory. We don't have enough water sometimes, and we don't have the material and need to be transported to the island. So we have some limitations that bring us to the, uh, let's say, uh, best solution or the best economic line in terms of development, which is tourism. This is restricting our competitiveness, but at the same time, we believe it's creating a lot of value. The numbers we have seen before translate into an impact of more than 40% of our GDP in tourism. So for us, it's really an economic pillar of the economy and the society. This tourism, as I said, is creating a lot of value. This tourism is allowing us to have the infrastructures to support this number. These infrastructures are not only roads, are also hospitals. For example, recently, during the COVID um, uh, crisis, due to the big population that we have in terms of visitors, we had more than we needed in terms of hospital beds, in terms of hospital resources, and in terms of sanitary uh, resources. So for us, it was a big advantage during the COVID crisis that for a 1.2 million population, we had infrastructures ready to host 16.5 million people. So I believe in that case, we can really, really find out that uh, tourism is creating a, a value to the, to the island. Don't forget about the number of jobs that this is creating, because even though we would like to have uh, less seasonality and have uh, jobs that last more months during the year, this is creating an incredibly, incredibly uh, big value for the society. So in terms of jobs, services, infrastructures. So you would say, why change? Why change if we are so successful and we are having this number of visitors that are uh, really spending and leaving lots of economic value in the island? I think it's the moment to stop and think about the dependencies and the risks that we are having having such a lot of percentage, a big percentage of the GDP depending in tourism. We are having an issue with the uh, resource consumption, especially the water. This is being increased by the climate change because we cannot rely as in the past to have the same water uh, reserves that we have in the past because the weather is not behaving in a predictable way during this um, new Eras for these new uh, seasons and years. So we think uh, we should twist this uh, issue. We should twist and see the challenge as an opportunity to become a laboratory. Because I think we are in a privileged position. All the islands that are hosting and have economic, um, as an economic pillar tourism, we have a big opportunity to be a laboratory 
for initiatives regarding climate change and improving, you know, the impact that tourism is leaving in the in the territory. Not only this is a opportunity, I think it's an obligation that we have because if we don't adopt these measures, if we don't stop and think, if we don't believe that is the right time to make a big change, there will be no future for us because we will lose competitiveness. So even if you want to look at it from a selfish point of view, I think we have the obligation for preserving the territory and the resources we have if we want to still be competitive in the future. I think all the touristic uh, destinations have to think and have to have this uh, mindset from now on. What is part of our solution? And I'm going to give you an example or examples that are working in the Balearic Islands. They don't necessarily have to work in the territory in your territories, but for us, we think it's a good way to start thinking about the solution and putting in place measures that are improving the situation. We very recently approved in the Parliament a sustainability and circularity law. The first law in Europe that is speaking about circularity in tourism. This law uh, is a, a, a new legislation and the goal is to minimize all the negative impacts that the touristic activities having in the territory. So what we will aim to have a rene, rene, oh sorry, I always have problems with this uh, word. Regenerate, regenerate, regenerative tourism. Sorry, I have to laugh because it's impossible for me. Turismo regenerativo, I'm going to say it in, in Spanish, instead of a, a touristic activity that is having a negative impact in the territory. So we want tourism with a positive impact. Uh, we need to consider this impact, not only the environmental side of it, but also the social side of it. Of it. And I will explain now uh, why. In this new law, I think we've been very ambitious. And with these 450,000 beds that we have in the territory already, we think it's enough. We think we cannot increase more the number of hotels we have, the, the number of rooms that we offer. So we put and stop for four years in any increase regarding new hotels, new development in the island. Because as I say, with the number of visitors that we have currently, we think it's not the time now to grow. We want to grow in value and we would, don't want to grow in amount of, of, of visitors. So first measure to put a stop to new hotel development and to new uh, touristic uh, places or, or beds. The second big measure is that um, uh, there will be an obligation for all the touristic companies to have a circularity evaluation. They will need to do a plan. They will need to sit at least once a year and make an evaluation about how they are consuming energy and where are the sources of this energy, how and how much water are consuming, what are the materials they are using to do reforms and also to do a uh, um, let's say, to serve their, their guests. How are they treating food? And if there is any food waste that we can treat in a different way, and all the kinds of waste that we are having in the, in the industry. So uh, we think this is very important because it will put the companies thinking and uh, in, including circularity in their processes. Do you remember when compliance was not an issue? Nobody was thinking about compliance. Nobody was thinking about uh, uh, data protection, for example, and at the end of the day, now it's part of all the processes that uh, you do in the organizations. Now we know that when we design a new process, we need to incorporate this mindset and we need to incorporate these factors. Why not incorporate circularity mindset, a circular mindset to the new and existing processes in the organization? So to help them with that, they will do uh, this uh, yearly evaluation. And then they will do a plan because they need to improve. So there will be, a, let's say, a picture on how I am today, and then another picture on where I want to be and in how many years. So they will have to put in place a circularity plan. 
And this is an official document that must be shown to the authorities when we go to visit the hotel. So this is not voluntary, it's an obligation. Okay? Because Thank with this, we will, um, it will be an obligation for them to think about the circular strategy. And I think it's, it's, it's mandatory to do that. We will accompany them with uh, European Union funds. Bonnie, I don't know if you want to say something. Uh, yes, I just, uh, I would like to, um, soon we have to move on to the next speaker. Um, oh, sorry, yeah. sorry. <laughs> I thought, so very, very quickly, just one minute uh, before I say um, goodbye to all of you and thank you for, for having here. This is another measure that we are incorporating in this new law and is the obligation to install um, elevating mechanism in all the beds in the hotel so that the workers that are making the, the bed do not have to, uh, you know, incline themselves and make the effort of pushing up the, the mattresses, which are every day more and more, they are heavier and they are bigger every day. So again, thinking about sustainability, not only from the environmental point of view, but also from the social point of view. Very quickly, I'm going to say goodbye. It was really a pleasure and I would really like two hours to explain all the measures, but uh, really thank you very much for having me here today and giving me the opportunity to share these measures with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rosanna. I think you touched on so many of the issues that many islands struggle with and also some of the opportunities that they have. I think it's incredibly important to not only support initiatives for circular and sustainable tourism, but also write them into the laws, which you are a great example of. So thank you for that. And um, I would like to now move on to our next speaker, Diana Kerner. Uh, Kerner, sorry, Sustainable Tourism Consultant and co-founder of the Seychelles Sustainable Tourism Foundation, who I'm sure can also show us some excellent examples of what's been going on in the Seychelles. Welcome, thank Diana. So, thank you so much for the introduction, Bonnie, and it's really an honor to be here today and um, to be speaking together with um, ambassadors from other islands and to hear um, what great approaches um, you have. So I'm going to give you a big, uh, quick overview. Um, so I'm speaking to you today from Chumba Island, um, a private island off the coast of Zanzibar, which is the first privately managed marine protected area in the world, financed for ecotourism. But I'm actually here speaking on behalf of the Seychelles Sustainable Tourism Foundation. So it shows you how we are kind of all connected as islands and how we can share uh, some lessons learned. So um, in terms of the Seychelles Sustainable Tourism Foundation, it's an NGO that I co-founded um, together with the local Seychellois, Daniela Payet, uh, in Seychelles in 2017. Um, and I'm going to talk to you a bit about our vision, our areas of work, and what we, um, the sort of vision for tourism um, that we support in Seychelles. So we really come from the, from the mindset that we want to bring um, different tourism stakeholders in Seychelles together as a connecting platform. So um, our board reflects that with board members from public private sector directly out of tourism, but also from other areas. And the vision that we uh, set ourselves is to make Seychelles an international best practice example for sustainable tourism through an integrated collaborative approach between public private sector, academia and NGO. And uh, Rosanna, the previous speaker, has perfectly um, sort of highlighted this aspect of islands being a laboratory. And I think this is something that we also really believe in. As islands are small, if you bring the right people together, if you have an ambitious vision and join forces, you can really see um, tremendous good coming out of that. So the areas of work um, are very much linked to the different stakeholders that, that we work with. So we work closely with public sector, um, have agreements with the Ministry of Tourism, with the Hospitality and Tourism Association, other NGOs, academia. Um, and the activities at center around uh, awareness raising. Um, I'll talk to you a bit more about a specific campaign that we launched. We had events on um, thematic areas of interest, um, education and trainings. In terms of sustainability um, trainings for hotel accommodation providers um, and capacity building uh, sessions. We also work on product development, uh, where we very much have the vision that we want to move Seychelles away from that classical sun and beach um, destination. Of course, tourists continue to come for the incredible beaches that the Seychelles have, but there's so much more to offer. And um, we really want to showcase that cultural, that ecotourism potential that the islands have. 
Then another very important aspect, and that ties very much in with what Island Innovation is doing, is this lobbying and partnership element. Um, so we, on the one hand, want to facilitate partnerships within uh, Seychelles, but we are also um, pursuing some, uh, partnerships with other islands um, to, to work together. And last but not least, an area that we're very passionate about is to inform um, evidence-based decision making and policy making. So we have conducted a number of uh, research projects, one of them a willingness to pay survey to see whether tourists are willing to pay for an environmental fee in Seychelles. We also supported carrying capacity studies in the inner island in the island, sorry, and um, conducted our own research on the economic benefits of uh, certified sustainability certified hotels in Seychelles. So how can we build a sustainable tourism in our islands? Um, the sort of buzzword of this panel is uh, the regenerative um, approach. And that's also something that we firmly believe in. So to have an approach that not only minimizes the impacts of tourism on our islands, but that actually leave our islands a better place. And in many cases, um, the islands are biodiversity hotspots, which we can really um, um, support and, and regenerate through for tourism activities. But on the other hand, there's also the aspects of having educative and authentic experiences. Research uh, by Booking.com shows that actually 73% of travelers are looking for genuine cultural experiences. And in the case of Seychelles, and I'm sure in many other island um, cases as well, there's so much room uh, for improvement of really um, getting in touch with the true um, authentic culture of, of each island. And then it's about local value creation, of course, where we want to make sure that island communities are empowered, um, that we strengthen value chains. Of course, this is limited. Um, what you can do, because of course, in the case of Seychelles, it's 115 islands with 90,000 inhabitants. There's only so much that you can produce locally, but there's scope to into, um, introduce locally made products, local services more actively um, in the tourism supply chain. And then to diversify the tourism products, the tourism experience, something that is the case for Seychelles as well as that there was a heavy focus on the accommodation sec sector, which has just been booming, but there's so much more to tourism, so many more experiences that go beyond accommodation experiences that we can offer. So the aim really is high yield, low impact. So to go away from just looking at visitor numbers, but at actually looking at what kind of visitors are we attracting and how can they create positive impacts um, in the destination. Speaking specifically about climate action, because that is also um, something that is very much at the forefront of this panel. Um, what we have seen in the, in the time that we have existed is that uh, we really believe in the power of inter-island partnerships and initiatives. Um, in 2017, we hosted an international conference on sustainable tourism in island states in Seychelles. And out of that conference came a partnership with the island uh, destination of Vanuatu in the Pacific, specifically to exchange best practices, experiences in regards to, to sustainability. We are also a signatory of the One Planet Glasgow Declaration, um, which basically um, fights for climate climate action in tourism, and of course we support national processes um, in the destination. And last but not least, um, how to create awareness and partnerships within the destination. So I mentioned our pristine Seychelles campaign, which was specifically um, developed with local stakeholders to inform guests and to engage guests via social media, but also at certain touch points in the destination to have more meaningful travel experiences. And then there is a range of very promising um, carbon offsetting ecotourism activities that are taking place in Seychelles, um, where there's also scope to further develop these um, to get tourists basically involved in tree planting activities so that there's also this, this notion of offsetting their flight emissions by doing something good and donating for that specific activity um, to, in the, this case, it's the Seychelles Parks and Garden Authority. Yeah, so I hope I didn't, um, I'm just about in time. I think Bonnie <laughs> already switched on the camera. So thank you so much for having me and I look forward to any questions and further discussions. Thank you so much, Diana. That was really interesting. And I think it's uh, so inspiring the way you're trying to get tourists to see that the Seychelles is much more than sun and sand and doing that by raising awareness and connecting different stakeholders across sectors. So thank you for your speech. And um, yes, I think we will have lots of interesting questions, I hope. Uh, so I would like to move on to our next um, 
our, our next speaker who uh, can tell us. <laughs> I would like to move on to our next speaker, who um, is Carl Hunter, the property manager of St. Lucia's Anschastanet and Jane, Jade Mountain Resorts, which are absolutely gorgeous resorts on the island of St. Lucia. And uh, we're, I would love to hear from him now. Welcome, Carl. Thank you so much, Bonnie. And um, again, thanks to everybody for the amazing invitation to come and share with you this morning. Um, it is the morning in St. Lucia, we're in the Caribbean. Um, and I really feel privileged that uh, I'm able to showcase our properties and discuss a little bit with you about some of the initiatives that we have pursued, um, you know, really to em embrace our environment and sustainability. Um, we, we're uniquely located uh, on a beautiful island that really is a, a very green destination. Um, and we really try to emulate that in everything that we do. Um, some of the things we have really focused on initially, obviously, is our sustainability from our core, which is uh, the way that the property was designed to be sustainable and low energy. Um, Jade Mountain and Anne Chesney rooms are all with one wall missing, so you're really in contact with nature. Um, we use natural ventilation for thermal comfort. We don't have air conditioning. Um, the way that the building was designed up at Jade Mountain is that there is a large opening at the front face of the building where you can reach out and connect. Uh, and the rear of the building is slightly narrower. So um, by simply attenuating the louver pitch, you can control airflow through the room and increase or decrease the amount of air movement um, without having energy, any energy applied to that process. Um, also, each of our open edges has a swimming pool located on that open edge. So the inflow of air coming over the water provides an additional evaporation cooling effect. So this really helps with our guests having a very high thermal comfort, um, although we're not using any energy at all to do that. That's just the natural trade winds and the position of the building and the innovation within the design. Um, we're ultra low energy footprint. Um, we don't actually have televisions or radios or really anything in the room that's consuming power. Um, but the room environment is such an amazing space um, that our guests are not disappointed. They're not missing these elements and they quickly disconnect and get into that real nature connection uh, with us during their stay. Um, we're all 100% LED lighting, which most of us are these days. Um, our biggest power consumer for Jade, given that we have a pool in every room, is keeping 300,000 gallons in constant circulation. And so we again minimize the power associated with that um, by using inverter speed controlled water pumping um, throughout um, our guest rooms. Um, we do some unique things with um, portable water. Um, we're very lucky that within the estate, there used to be an old sugar uh, plantation and to power that sugar plantation um, back in around 1780, a large reservoir was created to create an aqueduct feed source for the um, sugar crushing process. And we managed to repurpose that, rehabilitate it, bring it back into use. And um, we now use that water. Um, it's fed by gravity um, all the way around to a water treatment plant. And then we pump it up to the top of the hill so that once we've invested the energy into transforming the water into very high quality potable water, we have no additional energy for distribution as it's all done by gravity. Um, the water is such so remarkable. Uh, we've now extended and have started our in-house uh, bottled water program. So all our guest room amenity water is bottled from our source um, and is a great product, has been very well received by our guests and in turn has eliminated the need that kind of crept in around the time of COVID where people were becoming ultra sensitive about sanitization. And so we've now managed to eliminate all of the plastic bottles associated with uh, water distribution and water consumption by our guests. Um, wastewater management, again, very unique, certainly within St. Lucia as to how we've chosen to manage this. We, we have some significant land within the uh, estate. We partnered with the World Health Organization um, who came and assisted us in planning, um, not only for the location, but also the capacity and the aquaculture selection 
um, our reedbed system. So a reedbed system is essentially um, a man-made natural wetlands which replicates the way nature would deal with um, waste um, with, and wastewater within the natural environment. Um, so this um, comes to it's a, a zero uh, energy system with the exception of the pump needed to lift the water to the top of the reed beds. And the water percolates down through the reed beds, interacts with the aquaculture and um, denitrifies, removes the ammonia and uh, gives me a high quality, what's termed as a polished effluent. It's a hundred percent closed loop. Uh, none of the effluent uh, that is produced from uh, the outflow uh, goes to the marine environment. We have two uh, large terraces where we do soil percolation. Um, this actual uh, initiative gained us uh, some interest regionally this year, and we're very proud to have been awarded the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States Ocean Champions for 2022. Um, by virtue of this and other initiatives that we do to protect our nearshore environment. Um, waste management, um, big challenge within St. Lucia. Um, unfortunately, we are quite a micro economy. We're 180,000 people um, and waste isn't generated on the scale that makes recycling on a national um, platform uh, very viable. Um, so essentially everything that's produced as waste in St. Lucia tends to end up at the landfill. So what we decided to do is become innovative in the absence of a national recycling program and look at what we could divert from the landfill. So as we've accumulated waste, rather than automatically sending everything to the landfill, we partnered with local informal recyclers. Uh, we understood what their needs were and what volume we would have to have to interest them to come and invest in trucking to take it away and put it into a recycle program. Um, last year, we were able to actually dispose of 22 tons of waste that otherwise would have gone to the landfill. So a very interesting program. Um, um, one of the outshots of that is also we do um, a large composting and soil regeneration program. Um, we also run um, a small organic farm. Um, we do our own cacao production. We do actual tree to bar. Um, so not just bean to bar. We grow the trees that produce the beans and we go all the way through to an amazing chocolate product. Um, we do some real special events as seasonality allows. We do an annual mango madness festival where we get our guests involved in picking, harvesting, creating mango chutney, enjoying all things mango. Um, we've partnered with the St. Lucia Hotel and Tourism Association, and we were one of the initializers of the Virtual Agricultural Clearinghouse Program, which is a very unique and zero cost to implement program that links the agricultural producers, small and large, on island directly with chefs within the hotels and purchasing agents within the hotels simply through WhatsApp platforms, and that's been tremendously uh, viable and has given those linkages that otherwise uh, would cause a lot of spoilage of produce um, and small producers, um, giving them direct access to chefs. So, you know, from 15 kilos of tomatoes and upwards, we're interested and can find a marketplace for that produce at its ripest to uh, be consumed and, and not impact on waste. Um, we're very focused overall on our sustainable operations and stewardship. We have embedded uh, six ethical core sets for safeguarding children, protection of local customs, health and safety quality assurance. We're also keenly focused on human rights and management of environmental impacts. We get very involved in our community. Um, we support local artists. We actually have an art gallery on property for artists and sculptures to exhibit. Um, we do all, all of the usual things like litter picks, etc. cetera. Um, but we also have recently built a cricket pitch for one of our local communities. We're currently refurbishing the comprehensive school in town. They had a home economics room and we're creating that into a culinary arts center so that within the school environment, we're assisting propelling people and preparing them for a work environment within hospitality. Um, one of the things that we're proud of is we do a lot of um, coral uh, nursery, a lot of coral growth um, in order to re-stimulate our coral uh, nearshore environment. 
And everything that we do, um, we openly share. We're highly visible. Um, we are um, on the World um, Sustainable Tourism Council, um, but we also work with local businesses and obviously hospitality members to share our best practice and help influence change and, and natural change within the business in general and solution. Um, uh, Carl, we're already quite over time. I'm going to have to ask you to, uh, although it's super interesting, to try to wrap it up quickly. <laughs> Last slide. So we're just okay, finally, perfect. Yeah, these, these are our external accreditations. Um, I'm going to slip through this because we're short on time and say thank you. I want to thank um, you all in um, from Carolyn Trebetsko's behalf. Um, Carolyn is our owner, managing director, innovator, visionary, um, and currently she's also the chair of St. Lucia National Conservation Fund and the Caribbean Biodiversity Fund, um, again, helping extend our reach to many different areas. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carl. I think it's so great to see um, yeah, how initiatives are really happening on the ground and how your hotels are sustainable by design. So sometimes the tourists don't even necessarily notice that they're acting in a more sustainable way, but the way you've designed it facilitates that. And then of course, also the connection to the nature and the Mango, Mango Madness Festival sounds pretty cool as well. <laughs> really Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Um, so I would like now to go to our next speaker, who's also a CEO of a um, accommodation uh, in the Greek islands. So Stavros Kaptanakis, a CEO of Tala. I hope I get this right. I know you told me how to say it before, but Tala Ses Crete Holiday Home Domacy Development of the Greek islands. Welcome, Stavros. Hello. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, Crete is an island from one end to the other. You need the four hours and you feel like you have gone around the world. In Crete, you can find sun, sea, mountains, rivers, lakes, snow, olives, oil, oranges, bananas, apples, and many others. Crete is located in the southernmost tip of Europe and geopolitical, its position is strategic for Europe. The people are its biggest capital since they are hospitable and open health. The Gretan diet is world famous and we have also managed to increase the average life expectancy of its residents. One of our resorts, Thalasses, is a luxury resort with the goal being to promote responsible travel and high sustainability standards. Our vision is uh, five-star hotels and five-star communities is located in the center of Crete on a quiet beach. The resort location is not far from the island famous uh, Arkady Monastery. This small resort offers a boutique hotel with a restaurant, and the hotel includes two and three bedroom spa villas and is used exclusively for accommodation. The location of the resort offers opportunity to explore the people, culture, traditions of the island. This is the best achieved by low impact cycling and hiking. Sorry, we seem to be having some feedback issues on the sound quality. Uh, Christian, are you? Oh, and now the speaker is muted. Stavros, you're muted at the moment. I think the technical team is just working on it. Stavros, if you could try your microphone again, you can unmute yourself now. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. So uh, the location of the resort offers opportunity to explore the people. Apologies, Sabres. Uh, we get the feedback sound again. I don't know if you can change your setting over there. Yeah, we're still getting Sorry, I don't know what happens. Yeah, okay, sorry again. Uh, in the world, there is a demand for sustainable or responsible travel in taking, talking about sustainability. Apologies, Cyrus, but it's uh, super difficult to hear you. I don't know if you could try to unplug in and plug in back in your microphone. No. It is better now. It's okay now, huh? Yes. Okay. Maybe now you can hear me, it's okay? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, okay. 
So the allocation of the resource offers opportunity to explore the people, culture, tradition of uh, the island. This is the best archive for low impact cycling and hiking. The chance to explore local villages, the monasteries, local markets, and taste local. In the world, there is a demand for sustainable or responsible travel. In talking about sustainability, it usually means that we can do the activity in the same or similar way in three main aspects. Environmentally, this is the first one. The activity minimizes any damage to the environment, like flora, uh, fauna, water, soils, energy use, contamination, etc. And the ideal tries to benefit the environment in a positive way. Socially and culturally, the activity does not harm and may revitalize the social structure or culture of the community where it is located. And the third one is economic. An activity does not simply begin and then rapidly die because of bad business practice. It continues to contribute to the economic well-being of the local community. A sustainable business should benefit its owners, its employees, and its neighbors. With these three, we call triple bottom line. Ever environmentally, sustainable tourism provides an economic incentive for destinations to avoid extraction-based economies, providing employment while decreasing carbon-intensive practices such as mining, deforestation, as well as agriculture. Tourism is a both contributor to climate change and a victim of its impacts. Climate change meeting, uh, meet, uh, and adaptations are not just about protecting the environment. It is also about protecting the communities and the destination we all love and the tourism industry itself. Because tourism touches multiple industries, including transport, food, productions, retail, construction, a positive shift in the sector will have a major impact on economies around the globe. From our side, as a company, as domestic developer, we try to make constructions with low energy footprint as much as possible. In all of our projects, in thalasses, in hotels, in the other projects, we don't build everything. We leave empty space for green and for soil. We use only local workers. We encourage our guests not to use a car for short distance, and we provide them with bicycles for free so that the benefits are multiplied. We minimize food waste by trying the breakfast served in the suite or in the villa. We clean all the sheets and linen is uh, only with biological products. From the part of social, du during the fall, we organize our team provides sustainable source food with top local chefs, chefs, working with local women and teaching some traditional preparation techniques. Thalassus Resort also hosts meetings with local fishermen to advise them on available resources and tactics to improve their livelihoods. We develop uh, English language route guide maps for churches, monasteries, and other cultures uh, attractions in our area in Crete. We only recommend restaurants and tavernas with organic products and cultural events. Thalassus concept is definitely by authenticity and our beach lunch, it is a pure expression. We renovate an old fisherman bar and serve from a wooden bar topped by touch roof. This is a low impact, sustainable and enjoyable. Light cuisine with get and products and innovate touch and inspire tropical cocktails from Dictamo. This is a Greek a plan and uh, this plan grows on our private beach. It's between the rocks and to the sea. Other activities like surfboard, wooden gym, snorkeling, theater, diving, wedding venues, all in quiet in these quiet beats are happening and it's just 10 minutes from the main uh, town of Crete uh, by bike. On our beach, we host the longer turtle during the summer. We are working together with an international uh, Union, they call Archelon, and the local authorities, we cooperate also with local authorities and businesses to promote practical solutions for cons conservation of the coastal zone and the sea turtles within 
a more sustainable development scheme for tourism. And at the end, economy. Economy, this is also important because everybody must survive and uh, to be uh, to survive in the economy uh, area. We cooperated with the universities, the local universities, and we host summer schools in hotels of our group. Uh, and we are about the culture tradition. They they, they are uh, they have some events for uh, and some uh, the summer schools are about the culture traditions of Greece and Crete. I believe that tourism also needs education. It wants to understand more deeply the Minoan culture that we have here in Crete, and at the same time become a defender of protections of the monuments. We believe that this way is to help the local economy. And also, at the same time, we are make our own economy viability. Thalassus is you, not Stan. just another boutique resort with villas, but it's an experiment that has withstood the difficult effects of the coronavirus and at the same time offers to our place and society. Thank you. Thank, <laughs> thank you so much, Stavros. I can really Sorry see that. Sorry for uh, interrupt. <laughs> oh, that's OK. That's OK. I can really see that your your accommodation is going be above and beyond to really integrate sustainability into all aspects of your of your company. So that's really inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now I would like to invite our final speaker, Nico Muro, who's the founder of Visit Procida. Is Nico with us today? Seems that he dropped off money, so we can go on for the Q&A. Okay, great. Well, then, um, thank you, first of all, to all the inspiring, um, all the inspiring speakers, and also to the participants in the chat. It's really great to see everybody so excited about this topic. Um, so I would like to go to some questions from the chat. I see that a couple of them have already been answered, but maybe uh, there can be an elaboration. Um, so we have a question from Pamela Burnside for Carl. Um, Pamela says, good day, Mr. Hunter, who was the architect for your resort? Was it someone from the Caribbean region? And, um, maybe Carl, you could also elaborate on how the architect can become involved with designing sustainable solutions. Sure. Very much. Um, um, so actually, uh, architect is also the owner. He's the husband of Carolyn Trubetskoy. So that's Mr. Nick Trubetskoy. Um, he spent over 45 years in St. Lucia was inspired by the environment, um, was an architect um, by trade, and just simply studied and studied and contemplated. And by the time he was able to build his own hotel, um, he did it the right way. A very innovative, um, creative thinker, um, a little challenging to work for, but a brilliant guy and um, has inspired all of us um, and a lot of other people. Thank you. Uh, now I have a question for, I think it's not directed at any particular speaker, but Gunter Koch asks, how can local politician and business decision makers be motivated to become more conscious about protection of nature to adopt sustainable economy and climate actions? Populistic policies lead to maximized number of tourists, but they want to please local population and voters as well. So how do you balance that? The floor is open to all of you. Yeah, that's an excellent uh, question, uh, Günther. I think um, it's something that many uh, destinations, many island destinations um, are sort of struggling with, that there's very short term sightedness of decision makers and sort of really a focus on how many visitors do we attract, how many numbers, how many new investments, and not necessarily on, on how do we ensure that our destinations are, are there for generations to come. The, the point there really is about making the business case and seeing the examples from the previous two speakers, there is a business case that a sustainably managed um, uh, organization, business uh, destination is possible and that there's an increasing demand for these kind of um, products around the world. So at the end of the day, it's for, for the policymakers, for the, um, it's about 
realizing that in order to stay competitive as a tourism destination, you have to look at the business case of sustainability and see that it's all connected. So if we protect our environment, um, ultimately, this will also bring us more uh, economic prosperity. So hopefully, this is something that more destinations will and um, key policymakers will, will realize. Thank you, Diana. I would like to move on to the next question from Charlie. Uh, can the speakers discuss what some of the challenges were when implementing advanced technologies and perhaps even failures of in implementing advanced technologies? I'm kind of tempted to jump in here as a, an engineer by profession. So <laughs> odd, oddly enough, I've spent 26, 27 years engineering in the Caribbean, and I've spent a lot of my career de-North Americanizing and de-European the Europeanizing um, core engineering facilities that were appropriate engineering for other destinations. And so we've really adopted the, the keep it simple, have tons of redundancy, focus on energy consumption. And so we've developed what we think is, uh, uh, should be entitled the Caribbean centric approach to engineering. And it's not just a Caribbean centric approach. So you should consider the resources, the skill sets, um, and the appropriate, the, the technology that's appropriate for your environment. Um, it's very easy when you're building a hotel to embrace an externalized design, but you have to look forward and really contemplate how do you look after this and how do you uh, maximize its life cycle um, and really, really, um, you know, hit the mark in delivering the quality that your guests expect at the same time. It's a difficult and challenging balance, but it's not always um you know the bigger designs that work um it's really thinking about what is going to be um, good for your specific environment and destination yeah i think that's such an important point that you make carl that uh, applications have to be tailored to the specific destination and something that works in europe or the us might not be the perfect solution for the caribbean so i think it's uh, yeah thank you for that um okay i have a question from tino also to everybody um, does anyone have examples of how information technology applications have been used to achieve the sustainable goals of the island, specifically within the tourism sector? Uh, Tino, before we get back to that, do you mind elaborating on what you mean exactly by information technology applications? Unless, uh, oh, hi, Nico. Hi, to let you know that Nico is also here. Ah, um, perfect. So we have the presentation. Okay, great. Welcome, Nico. So, um, yeah, I would just like to introduce now our uh, final speaker, Nico Miro, who's the founder of Visit Proceda. So now we, uh, yeah, we'll hear from Nico. Hi, thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for this nice invitation. I don't know what happened, but uh, actually, I, you know, I was following the uh, the panel, but uh, uh, Zoom didn't allow me to to speak <laughs> when you when you called me first time. So uh, let me introduce myself. I'm the founder uh, of um, Visit Prashida, which is the main local uh, DMC, and uh, as well as I'm a board member and the uh, local representative of the National Hotelier As Association, which is Federal Bergi. Um, I'm uh, basically living and working on this island, which is the smallest island of the Bay of Naples. And uh, it was recently nominated the Italian capital of culture. Um, I won't be speaking about numbers, but I would like to speak about culture, how the culture uh, can influence the, the tourism and uh, can create connection and cooperation with the local communities. Uh, this is the story, actually. This island, it's uh, probably very singular island because uh, it's very small, like four square kilometers with the high uh, population density, probably one of the highest of, highest of Europe. 
10,000 people living in this small island uh, with an economy uh, completely uh, not connected to tourism. So most of the people used to be fishermen or sailors and the local community always refused, rejected and didn't want to tourists to come because they, they, they wanted to protect, you know, like the environment and they, they really didn't think that the place was suitable. So uh, this place was completely unknown, uh, despite was uh, among the most like famous uh, destination of tourist destination of Southern Italy, like Amalfico's, like Capri, like Napoli. Uh, this place was completely unknown. So two years ago, the local uh, municipality uh, decided to participate in this competition, this uh, capital of culture, with a project called uh, The Culture Does Not Isolate. So basically, uh, they participated in 2020 and they, and they basically won. So uh, the island was nominated uh, during the COVID time, during I mean, 2021. Um, Italian capital of, capital of culture for 2022. So the project was based on um, <clears throat> 44 cultural events uh, with the, designed for involving and uh, cooperating with the, with the local community. Uh, I really want to speak about this because this is a, for me a bright example of, about sustainable tourism because this kind of even small events like starting from the from the local communities in involving the local community they basically attract a special uh, kind of tourism like uh, people interested in um, in sustainable tourism in cultural events uh so we had the big flow of number like almost half million in the first uh, part like until the end of from january uh to until the end of august and uh, this kind of um events this kind of approach helped the local community to accept this big flow and the attracted a very interesting kind of, of tourists. So not big events, uh, less souvenir shop and more like a permanent uh, art exhibitions and, uh, and uh, typical and uh, events which involved the, the local community. Why I'm speaking about that? Because we, when we speak about uh, sustainability, probably we should consider also like the impact on the local communities. So I think that th this is a very bright example and it can be a case, a case history for, for the future about how like the culture can uh, drive, it can uh, like uh, help to, 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 to drive the tourism and uh, to interact with the local community and the local and the impact with them. I know that the time is flying, so I will uh, stop. I will finish here. Thank you so much, Nico. It's great to see also from a destination management perspective what can be done. So yes, thank you. And I, I really uh, resonated with what you said about the tourists, for example, not wanting, not really welcoming tourism at the beginning, but then when you integrate them. At all. At all. <laughs> yeah. But then when you integrated them into designing their own industry, then they became it was more... like there was a, a, like a process of cooperation and of co-creation in every event. So the, basically the community felt involved. And this is very nice. I mean, you don't feel that you're, that you're, that you're used but you feel that you are that you are involved for me that's something it's it's very nice let let's say that imagine that here there were like less than 15 hotels with less than 10 rooms until 5 years ago so the place was completely like a uh, virgin i would say like no tourism organization no accommodation and now it's slightly changing <laughs> yes thank you so much um, so we are unfortunately out of time for this session. So I would like again to have a big thanks to our speakers today, Rosanna Murillo, Diana Kerner, Carl Hunter, uh, Stavros Kapitanaskis, and Nico. Um, it was 
lovely hearing from all of you. And I hope that um, you continue with your uh, radical regenerative tourism initiatives. Thank you so much. Many thanks to Bonnie and all of our excellent speakers. This was a really inspiring session, some amazing initiatives talked about, and it's exciting to see how sustainable tourism is really developing across the world. Um, the next session today will be how a strong indigenous voice can help console global issues, which has been co-organized with the Institute for Small Islands. And it will begin in um, approximately two hours, so that'll be at 1 p.m. EDT, New York time, 6 p.m. BST, London time, or 3 a.m. the next day uh, over in Sydney time, AEST -A -A time. Um, I'd, like, I'd also like to invite you to connect with us on Instagram at, at underscore Island Innovation. Make sure to add the underscore before Island Innovation as our other Instagram account is no longer active. And uh, once again, thank you everybody for watching and hope to see you in the next session. Enjoy the rest of the virtual end summit. Bye everyone.